What's up, guys? Econ John here. Welcome to our fifth part in our five part series on macroeconomic consumption. In this video, we're going to talk about deviations from the permanent income hypothesis. Let's go. So, in this video series, we have studied the permanent income hypothesis as a tool for understanding fluctuations in consumption and why short term tax cuts have less of an impact on consumption than permanent ones. However, we have noted that our model of consumptions cannot account for equity premium as well as one of the permanent income hypothesis predictions is that there should be no relationship between expected income and consumption. This is because the main statement of the hypothesis is that the timing of income shouldn't matter. However, in Christopher Correll's and Lawrence Summers' 1991 paper, there is evidence that shows that such a relationship does exist. These issues have resulted in extensions and alternatives of our current models. These ideas are the concept of precautionary savings, the idea of liquidity constraints affecting uh, consumption patterns. And the third one is departures from full optimization, which is also known as the behavioral economics approach. So what is precautionary saving? Precautionary saving is defined as the excess saving that is done in the case of uncertainty with regards to future income. The logic is as follows. Suppose an individual is consuming under uncertainty with a quadratic instantaneous utility function as part of a lifetime utility function over some time of length n such that n is greater than 2. In this case, marginal utility from consumption is declining and increasing in absolute risk aversion. The amount of consumption consumers with such preferences are willing to give up rises with wealth. As a result, marginal utility from consumption is falling more slowly as consumption rises. Given this circumstance, we can say that a third derivative of this function is positive. With the risk aversion of our instantaneous utility function and a positive third derivative in our consumer's lifetime utility function, our individual will end up saving more systematically and increasing uh, their expected consumption. In terms of the impact of precautionary saving, recall that in our previous video, we derived the equation for approximating the equity premium as the following. Considering the case where our consumers are saving by investing in a risk-free asset and that our consumer's subjective discount factor is equal to that rate of risk-free saving, our equation becomes the following. With a little bit more algebra, we find that our expected growth rate from consumption is asymptotically equivalent to one half times theta, which is our coefficient of relative risk aversion, plus one times the variance in this growth rate of consumption. Thus, we can say the impact of precautionary saving depends on the coefficient of relative risk aversion theta and the variance of consumption growth, right, which is also interpreted as the risk associated with this growth rate from consumption. So let's now talk about liquidity constraints. Liquidity constraints and the possibility of them constrain consumption and can increase savings. In the case where our liquidity constraints are binding, our individual will consume less than they would in a situation than where they would have access to credit. By example, if our individual has you know, low income in one period, he can borrow against another period and repay that loan back in the following period. In the case where we have liquidity constraints, our individual can't borrow against his future income. In a case where liquidity constraints are not present but may bind in the future, our individual is going to save more to go and insure himself against such a situation. So to understand this, let's consider the case of a consumer making decisions using a quadratic utility function over three periods, beginning with our analysis of our consumer's behavior in period three. So we have our consumer's lifetime utility function from period two to three, right? We have uh, just our standard uh, instantaneous utility function plus the expectation based on all the information in period two uh, of this instantaneous utility function in period three. This is just C3 in uh, these two points. Um, we just put in their algebraic identities, which we go and we have a clear picture of. Um, so taking the derivative of this function with respect to consumption in period two, we get the following, which is little a, right, times the endowment at the start of period from period one to period two, plus the income from period one, plus the expected labor income from period three, based on the information in period two, minus two times the consumption in period two. Thus, the above expression for this is positive when our consumption in period two is less than 
our endowment from period one plus labor income in period two plus the expected labor income in period three based on the information in period two all over two. The implication of this is that if our individual has no liquidity constraints, he will consume where the consumption in period two is equal to the endowment from period one plus the labor income in period two plus the expected labor income in period three all over two. Otherwise, since he can't borrow against future income, he'll consume where his consumption is equal to the endowment from period one plus his labor income with certainty in period two. From our analysis before, we find that our optimal consumption in period two is defined as this function, where our consumption in period two is equal to the minimum between these two options. Um, this leads to a situation of increased savings overall. For an analysis of period one, recall our condition for period two. Um, this is defined as what we have seen already. Uh, for period one, based on some algebraic identities and uh, the law of iterative expectations, um, we go and we have that our consumption in period one must be less than our endowment uh, initially plus the labor income in period one plus the expected uh, labor income in period two based on the information in period one plus the expected labor income in period three based on the information in period one minus the consumption in period one all over two. Um, just moving uh, our equation around a little bit, just so we can get rid of C1 from the side, we go and we add C1 all over two from both sides. And uh, with a little bit more algebra, we go and we find that this, equ this equation below. So we see that even in the first period where there are no liquidity constraints, right? The mere fact that there may be liquidity constraints in the future, will go and constrain consumption, right? In period one. So in terms of the behavioral approach to this is that another reason why the permanent income hypothesis could not hold is because individuals usually end up following rules of thumb for their consumption patterns rather than optimizing as their income goes and changes. Alternatively, this could be due to the fact that our individuals possess discontinuous time preferences, meaning that their preferences aren't stable over time and previous optimizations that they went made in the past uh, have no weight on their decisions for their current consumption. Um, this could be due to the reason why we end up going and seeing that our expected uh, income does in fact uh, have an impact right on our consumption, right? Thus going and having an issue with the timing part of our permanent income hypothesis, which says that timing does not necessarily matter.